Well, I wanted to talk about, if we could, a couple of things today. <clears throat> One, obviously, with the movie Oppenheimer out and more discussion again about the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I'd like to talk about that. And then if, if, uh, if you, I know you always have insight, but I, I also would love to, to uh, talk a little bit about what's happening on the moon with the, the, the Russians getting ready to land a robotic uh, spacecraft on the Southern pole. China is, 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 is right around the corner. Next year, the United States is planning to land there. So I'd love to talk about that as well. If, if you would sure. like to. Sure. Okay. So, the first thing is let's let's just talk about. I mean, a have you seen the movie Oppenheimer? No, no. Okay. no I, I I haven't either. Are you planning to? Yes. Yeah. Well, maybe we could go together. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think I'll do Barbie, but I no. think Oppenheimer will probably. Be. <laughs> uh, I'm in full agreement with you. I I have no intention of seeing Barbie, but um, you know it's a. Uh, you know, she is an icon for what fifty some odd years. So I, oh, yeah. I guess I get it, but I'm not sure. But in terms of Oppenheimer, in terms of the atomic bomb, I'd like to sort of you know revisit that in terms of where that all began. I mean, I know that uh, you know Germany Werner Heisenberg. I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly. You know, was sort of the father of 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 German physics, nuclear physics won the Nobel Prize, I think, in 1932. And I guess the United States felt that we were sort of behind at that particular time. So tell me about sort of where you think the beginnings of our nuclear program began and sort of the, the inspiration, you know, for it, sir. Well, I, I think you really have to go back to, uh, you know, Einstein's uh, theories and and the the whole beginnings, you know, really go back to the early 1900s. Uh, not so much for the bomb, but the technology, the you know, the discovery of the atom, and uh, and and uh, Einstein and others were beginning to uh, develop these theories uh, that really led to the kind of research that you mentioned. Uh, I think uh, weaponizing the technology probably came as we got closer to World War II. I think in the late 30s, uh, uh, much of the research for potential using the technology and the discoveries and the theories in, for some sort of military application, you know, really began to be looked at by uh, Germany, amongst others. And then, of course, we felt we need to be involved in a program like that. Okay. And I mean, do you think in terms of once Germany sort of began to move forward with their development of a nuclear bomb, an atomic weapon, in terms of, do you think in those early days, especially under Oppenheimer, that the United States felt that they could catch up? Was that something that was, was there tremendous fear that uh, we were, we were so far behind? Yeah, I think uh, obviously the, the program uh, took on a, a new sense of urgency and a moment. Uh, and and obviously the military uh, got involved, and uh, and we were in, we began to get involved in both Europe and Japan, and uh, could see the potential for our enemies, particularly Germany, that might uh, this would lead to a race for this technology and what it could develop. So, yeah, I do think uh, you know we know about the uh, Manhattan Project and. Uh, the, the way the U.S. military approached it, the, the secrecy, the location of it out in a very remote area. Although the so the Russians managed to uh, uh, put spies in place uh, to get to learn about the technology and the development uh, into the program, uh, but I think that you know war has a way of focusing you on what might be a potential development and make you. Uh, give more urgency to the program. Okay. And, and do you think, I was going to save this question, but I, I'm going to jump in right now. Do you think, sir, that if if Germany had developed the atomic bomb before the United States, what actions do you think 
Hitler's Germany would have done with that with that with that technology, sir? Uh, I, I, you know, it's all speculation, but I think you know they were developing uh, V two rockets and they were uh, aiming them at the uh, at the UK, United Kingdom. I think there's a potential for them using them there. Uh, I don't know if they would have shared the technology with the Axis powers and and uh, and how that would have turned out. Uh, it 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 probably uh, would have they would have looked at it to kind of deal with their battlefield uh, setbacks as the war developed, particularly on the Eastern Front with Russia, uh, which was obviously uh, a, a case where they were being overwhelmed by uh, the size of the Russian forces and uh, the ability of the Russian forces to defeat their uh, their maneuver due to weather and other things that had happened. So I think you would have seen maybe use maybe more at the tactical level, but certainly more strategically in, in terms of uh, hitting the United Kingdom. You know, they early on, Hitler had hoped to invade the UK, and that just became too difficult yes. uh, because of the, the, the British uh, dominance of the seas at that point in time with their navy. And so I do think it, it would have been used. Now, uh, it, it's interesting because we, we look at the use of... Uh, of uh, biological and chemical weapons then, especially gas, you know, which had been done. And even right up to the end, the, Germany never used those kinds of weapons. Uh, would they have been constrained uh, in terms of use of a uh, atomic weapon? Uh, probably not if they thought they had it and the allies didn't. So that could have been a consideration too. Well, you, you mentioned the Eastern Front, and I, that certainly makes it plausible. Do, do you, under any circumstances, and I know I'm asking you to speculate, do, do you think that uh, if they had that technology that uh, they might have tried to strike the United States? Uh, I think, you know, at, once we got into the war, uh, I think uh, that would have been a possibility they would have had to develop a, a delivery system. Uh, I mean, the, the, to the extent they could reach the United States with certainly not with any missiles that they were developing or rockets that they were developing. Uh, so I think it might be more looking at the shorter ranges uh, in Europe and, and tactical use. It would have been a while before they could have developed a delivery system. So a as we look at Japan, and I'm curious about your thoughts on the decision to drop the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, especially in light of the very successful firebombing of Japan, and especially, you know, Tokyo, and I think Operation Meeting House, and I think March of 45, 100,000 people killed. Why, why do you think Truman decided not to continue with the firebombing of, of Japan and especially Tokyo, sir. Well, I might argue with uh, the term successful. I okay. think it was very frustrating for our strategic bombing uh, bomber commands in that, you know, it was a, it was a tough decision to decide on firebombing. That took a, a lot of uh, that resulted in a lot of controversial uh, criticism of uh the use of fire bombing, uh, you know, it, it began in Europe and bomber Harris, uh, you know, of, of the UK and uh, those that uh, practiced that, especially on cities, were were really uh, vilified by some people for doing it. And, and the decision to do it in Japan uh, wasn't achieving what we had hoped to achieve, which is a, a Japanese surrender. Uh, so I think in terms of the firebombing, uh, we weren't seeing the decisive kind of action that, that you know, we thought it might generate in terms of surrender or capitulation in some form. Uh, I also think Truman was faced with several other tough decisions. One is the invasion of Japan uh, would have produced high casualties amongst the Allies. Uh, a little known fact, uh, uh, we, we uh, cast... Uh, 500,000 Purple Hearts in preparation for the invasion of Japan. As a matter of fact, we're still using them. 
my Purple Heart from Vietnam was one of those. And we're, you know, gave them out in uh, the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, the most recent, and Korea, Viet, you know, Vietnam, uh, all along the way, and still have 120,000 left. So, you know, there were arguments about the numbers of casualties, but they certainly would have been, you know, it, it, in the range of uh, uh, tens to hundreds of thousands of, of casualties. So he had that weighing on him. Uh, would the American people accept the fact that he was reluctant to use a weapon system that might shorten the war? I think another reason uh, that that I think uh, played on his mind is that Russia had now just declared war on Japan and it was entering the war. And the likelihood of them taking on invading Hokkaido and some of the other islands and then occupy them uh, you know, we felt uh, there was a sense of urgency in ending that quickly so that they wouldn't fall into the Soviet communist sphere. Uh, and so that was another pressure point. I think also the idea that uh, we could do something that might encourage some sort of armistice. This is what the uh, Japanese wanted, some sort of negotiated settlement would have been politically difficult for Truman because his predecessor, FDR, uh, fully articulated no unconditional surrender from the beginning on 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 the enemy. So that would have been a tough political move to make. I, you know, obviously, the American public were still incensed by Pearl Harbor and the you know the uh, un, unannounced attack on us, and uh, he would have, I think, had very a lot of difficulty with that. I think. You know, it's, it, it, I'm not sure how much Truman understood what the bomb was. He was not let in on a program uh, from the beginning. Uh, he was told about it. But, you know, in the context of the times, thinking about a big bomb might lead to thinking, well, it's just more explosive power, you know, just a, an evolutionary sort of development from conventional weapons. Uh, the, the, you know, we didn't even know, even those in the Manhattan Project, what the extent of the uh, of the uh, lethal lethality of of that system would work i mean we when we dropped it even those that delivered it you know tibbets and his crew on the first one uh and and the follow up one you know they weren't even sure their plane could make it out of the blast radius and you know what would happen and they were awed by what they saw in the way of destruction Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think all those factors, it's easy to look back and make moral judgments on it. But I think it was a very difficult decision and one that he had a lot of, uh, of, of reason to, uh, to, to approve the use of it. And, you know, it, it, I'm sure it weighed heavily on all those who were involved afterward. Yeah. So do you think in terms of the continuation of the firebombing, and I appreciate you, you know, correcting me in terms of whether it was considered successful, but how much, how much consideration do you think Truman was giving the continuation of, of the firebombing? Uh, well, I know you mentioned, you know, the, the potential invasion of Japan, Russia's involvement. Um, but yeah, do, do you think that if, if maybe if that had continued for, another month or so that that might have turned the tide? I know it's hard to say, sir. Well, it's hard to say. And uh, from all indications, uh, there was no there was no sign that uh, the Japanese were willing to surrender. As a matter of fact, they were preparing for an invasion. So the firebombing wasn't having an effect. Uh, the, the, you know, there, there was a, a plan to blockade Japan and do all these other things, but that would have delayed the war. There were indications that Japanese intended to fight to the, you know, the last uh, citizen. I mean, they were arming their citizens. They were encouraging the, them to resist uh, uh, the, the landing and the forces that would come in. They had uh, divisions that were, uh, you know, unaffected by the, the war that basically were still intact in Japan uh, and, and I think that uh, if you read the tea leaves at the time, it just looked like the firebombing wasn't, you know, moving them to the edge. They were still defiant and resistant. As a matter of fact, uh, 
the decision after the atomic bombs were dropped uh, was was basically the emperor's, and he went against the uh, you know Tojo and the and the military who did not want to surrender even at that point. Uh, so you know, uh, and and again the timelines in terms of having to conduct an invasion and the, the potential of the Russians uh, beginning to take uh, Japanese territory, uh, prolonging the war more. Uh, uh, you know, I th I think those things all all led to the decision to drop it and see what happened. I think it's important to remember we only had two at the time, and uh, had they not uh, surrendered after the second one, it, it would have been some time before we could have developed a a third bomb. So you know, I'm not sure how that would have worked, and and whether the we would have delayed long enough. You know, the the plans for the invasion were uh were well developed i mean uh I, operation downfall with its two component operations olympic and uh coronet uh, when you looked at the numbers of troops it was almost two million that were going to be involved in that in that in those landings and, and uh you know allied forces it, it was going to the resistance was going to be definitely very difficult to deal the other factor that went into this, remember, prior to uh, going up to the edge of the uh, uh, Japanese uh, homeland islands, he had the experiences on Saipan, on Iwo Jima, and Okinawa. And we saw they were fighting to the death. There were no mass surrenders, there, you know, even when they were defeated. So, And, and we even saw some resistance from the people and, and of course, people committing suicide. So looked at the potential civilian casualties, self-inflicted or uh, fighting uh, or, you know, in the course of the war, which would have been astronomical. So I think all these things went into the mix that you have to understand uh, the environment at the time. Well, no, thank you for mentioning that, because I was going to ask about Okinawa and, and Iwo Jima, particularly in the, uh, I guess, what the what would you call it? The fear that it might have instilled in in the United States in terms of the uh, yeah, I think we were you know we we saw a form of warfare we hadn't really seen. I mean, it wasn't the same as Europe. We were we were seeing uh, you know Japanese soldiers were uh, and, and dying uh, you know rather than uh, surrender and capitulating, even when they knew defeat was there. Uh, I mean, there there were. There was a belief that Korobayashi, the commander on Iwo Jima, was sent there because that was the first island that we took that was part of Japan proper. It was actually part of the prefecture of Tokyo. Uh, and uh, his orders were to make the, make the Americans pay. They were, there was no, uh, I think, uh, reasonable Japanese leader that thought that, uh, you know, it somehow they would they would be able to to win, let's say, in in, in Iwo Jima and even Okinawa, uh, but to make the American casualties so high that they would not want to invade the, the, the islands, where the homeland islands, where it would have been much more stiff resistance uh, that they would face. Well, you said something very fascinating about Truman and obviously with, with the, the death of Roosevelt, him not knowing that much about the atomic project. Mm -hmm. um, how well versed was President Roosevelt? And do you think he would have had a different approach than Truman, General? I, I don't think I don't think it would have been different considering all these uh, uh, events that made up the the environment at the time. Uh, you know, I I I think that uh, if, when you look at the casualties. When you look at the sense of urgency in getting this war over, especially since we had ended the war in Europe, uh, when you look at the potential now of this rising Russian power and communism and the potential for it to then uh, uh, expand into the Far East and, and, and the Pacific. Uh, I, and, and I think that you don't discount the political side. If, if it became known that we had a a weapon that could possibly end the war, and we didn't use it, and we suffered the tens to hundreds of thousands of casualties. What, what would the American people response uh, have been? 
So you know, I I I don't I don't think it would have been different given the time by by anybody there at the time in the leadership position and the recommendations being made by the military and, and others. So um, was Roosevelt very knowledgeable about the Manhattan Project, sir? Well, I, I, certainly he approved it and he knew it was good. I don't think anybody, uh, as the project was evolving, you know, really knew uh, as it was going along to almost, you know, the completion uh, of it, that this bomb was even going to be viable or was possible, you know. So I don't think Roosevelt was, you know, hoping that this was the answer or anything like that before he, he died. I think he knew it was a project, that he knew it was a possibility, but certainly uh, they were looking at you know, an invasion of Japan you know, as the alternative. This was a wild card, uh, I think, in many people's minds. And, uh, you know, use it if it, we think it's effective. There were all sorts of problems. You know, once you developed a bomb, you had the whole problems I mentioned before about delivering the bomb. That was an iffy situation. You know, B-29s, you know, just to be able to carry it and 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 to have the range and the payload and, and even to be able to get out of the blast, as I mentioned, I mean, it, nothing was sure about this, uh, you know, so uh, it was pretty iffy on both both uh, both bombs. And by the way, we had two bombs. You know, we didn't have a third one. Mm -hmm. So like I said before, you know, it, it could have been a situation where you drop two bombs and it's a so what, you know. Right. I mean, there were more casualties from the firebombing than there were from the the two, uh, uh, you know, atomic bombs at that yeah. point in time. And we didn't, under, you know, to everything we we knew, we believed the Japanese people were resigned to fight to the death. They had been propagandized to believe that they would be uh, atrocities would be committed. They would be, you know, same thing happened in Saipan and, and Okinawa as we try to talk civilians uh, for, out of committing suicide. Uh, they they adamantly still believe that uh, everything they were being told. So. Why would we expect anything different, maybe more intense, since it was the home way? Well, in the past, we've talked about sort of the, the leadership and the greatness of George Marshall. Where, where, where was Marshall's position on the atomic bomb once he, once he sort of found out that uh, they were going to be dropped, sir? Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, Marshall, Marshall prop, I, I think most military people at that time maybe had a degree of skepticism about the effectiveness of the bomb. And I don't think anybody before it actually was done and, and realized what happened, thought it was a war ender. They were still focused on the plan to you know, uh, invade Japan. Uh, you had a disagreement between the Navy and the Army to a certain extent. Navy thought that, you know, uh, isolate the Japanese islands, blockade them, starve them out. Uh, you know, conduct strikes from the positions that the Navy, uh, naval forces could take in China and elsewhere uh, as we sort of close the ring around them and just wait it out. Uh, I think that that was an option that no one wanted to go through long, prolonged uh, kind of campaign, continuing fire bombings and that sort of thing. Uh, it, and for all the reasons I already mentioned, they felt they were in a time crunch to finish this thing off. Another question about that, General Zinni, is you talked about the Soviet Union had uh, declared war on Japan. H how close were they to actually launching offensives against Japan? They they were, uh, you know, I, th I think we knew of their plans now to uh, invade the Northern Islands and Hokkaido. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, I think Stalin's feeling that he wanted to get as much control of not only bigger parts of Europe as much as he could get away with, uh, but certainly having a, a foothold in the in the Pacific too. Uh, and and you know it was the idea of spread of communism, spread of influence. You know so. Uh, we were faced with this in Europe and, and obviously knew we couldn't help it because of, uh, you know, they they were the ones that went into Berlin uh, and and we were going to see a, a situation that was evolving in terms of uh, control now 
being an east-west uh, matter, and we could face this in the Pacific if we weren't uh, more proactive and more decisive in ending the war before they could get big chunks of uh, Japan and maybe elsewhere in the Pacific. No, thank, thank you for that, General Zenny. So let me sort of end this by asking one of the things, and I, and I don't know when this when this theory or thought came up, the idea that race played a factor in the dropping of the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. What's your sort of take on that, sir? Well, uh, you know, I... I, I... I, I think there probably was a degree of that, and, and maybe it was more generated by the unannounced attack on uh, Pearl Harbor and the beginning of the war. And then as the war progressed, seeing this uh, sort of culture that uh, uh, would fight to the last man, would rather die and commit suicide, you know, the kamikaze, the bonsai attacks, uh there was this you know in all wars especially at the in the past uh, it, there was a an attempt to somehow dehumanize or or maybe uh, in some way uh make the enemy lo look like a monster uh, and and you know the propaganda that goes out and the posters and everything uh you know so i i think in terms of what racism may have existed it, that had contributed a lot to the generation of that kind of uh, attitude. You know, uh, we saw that in terms of the uh, the Japanese Americans that were interred and 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 and, and sent to uh, camps uh, and and things that had happened uh, that maybe didn't happen with the, the Germans and Italians and others, and to a certain extent it did, but not very much. Uh, I, uh, you know, I mean American citizens and that and uh, that were here. Uh, so I, I think there was a mix of that. I don't think I think early on, you know, if you go back to the early 20s and 30s, there was actually uh, you go back to uh, the attitudes toward the, uh, that part of the world. There there was not so much racism. I mean, uh, we really uh, felt strongly about the uh, Chinese being victims of uh, the Japanese. And we had. Uh, you know, we we had a, a theater of operations, the Chinese India theater, and you know, we as Americans were were fighting side by side with the Chinese, Chiang Kai Shek, and all. So, I don't think it was an Oriental racist thing. I think it more I'm Japanese oriented, you know, and and it, and all, what might have contributed to those attitudes might have uh, the nature of the way the war began. And, was conducted by the other side it didn't seem like there was sort of the geneva convention adherence that we saw maybe a, elsewhere although you know probably was uh still so bad uh, even in, in europe I, I you know one interesting thing so we were in Nagasaki, my, my wife and i and we went and visited the uh the museum they have there and ground zero where the bomb was dropped there we got uh, we met with a survivor he was a, an interesting guy he he was uh, at the time he was 86 87 years old something like that really fit and hard and he told us his story he uh, he was basically a ground zero he was a teenager uh, you know and he was working in, in a munitions uh, factory and he got told by his boss to go to this other building to get some something and you know bring it back. And he went to the building, and the thing he was supposed to get was behind a big concrete wall. And so he's behind there getting it, and he said, all of a sudden he felt and sort of heard something. It, it, you know, it just was a, you know, what was that? It wasn't like a, a distinct thing he could hear. And he, it sort of stunned him for a while. And he said when he came out from behind the wall, everything was gone. And he was like standing there in this destruction, you know, and trying to make his way you know, uh, home and looking at all the uh, casualties and the destruction and everything else. And, and I asked him if he had any after effects. He said, 
no, he said maybe five or six years later, for some reason, his hair started falling out and he thought, oh, oh I got radiation poisoning or whatever. But then he said it was all OK. It was just uh, something that happened and you know, he looked strong and fit. And uh, the, the other interesting thing that struck me about being there was we walked around the park that marks ground zero. There were a lot of Japanese student groups coming through. And, you know, and uh, I, I was watching how they were looking at us, you know, Americans, you know, and they were very friendly. They all wanted to come up and say hello and everything else and greet us. And, you know, it. I, I didn't see a sense of bitterness. I think in many ways they, they came to the realization in their history and everything else that a, a lot of what happened they need to take responsibility for because of. Uh, you know the, the the military imperialism that uh, that generated maybe this. Uh, so they're more, you know, sort of looking at the world, finding a way to contain all this potential destruction, rather than looking at who's responsible for what or looking back at you know from uh, from times that uh, don't understand the context of the. Uh, of the period where these decisions were made. Well, on that note, I'm curious, what what impact do you think MacArthur had on, on Japan when, when you're talking about some of those stories, sir? I'm, I, you know, MacArthur's an interesting person. He, obviously, a, a very, very much a, a narcissist and very much uh, his own man. Uh, I think he was the forerunner of some of the combatant commanders we have now that have assigned regions of the world and obviously after that he he ended up with the uh, command in the pacific till he got relieved by truman uh but you know he, he, by all accounts he should have been very bitter about how things came about on the philippines where you know they were uh, attacked and uh you know, it, 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 in in another world, and if it wasn't MacArthur, he would have been relieved because he had six days' notice and he didn't do anything. You know, he didn't move planes, so he's extracted from Corregidor, builds his command, and he was hell bent to go to Japan and invade Japan. He would have been an overall command. There was even talk of giving him a sixth star, you know, uh, to command the operation uh, and be an overall uh, uh, leadership role. Uh, and then he comes to Japan, and he's he. It's really insightful in the way he sees the importance of building Japan. You know, it, it, there there's some remarkable leaders at this time, like Marshall and the Marshall Plan, like Eisenhower and how he understood uh, rehabilitating Western Europe and. Uh, and, and 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 doing something that had never been done in war before, where the winners actually pay reparations to the losers and build up their societies and change them for the better. Uh, he made some decisions that were not popular in the United States. One was the preservation of the emperor and his role, because he knew that was key to uh, Japanese society. I mean, it, it obviously modified his role as you know. Uh, as, as leader in a different form, as opposed to this godlike figure, uh, and, and 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 instilling democracy and making sure that you know it, it didn't fall into the trap of post-war corruption and all that sort of thing. So I, you know, I think it, it, looking at these leaders at this time, it, it, they were a remarkable set of 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 uh, men that uh, maybe we haven't repeated since or before <laughs> well no again uh, thank you thank you for your insights on on all of that uh, general zinni thank you so very much sure. so uh do you have a few more minutes yes okay so i'd like to move on move now to the present day and in the in the future so you know it's been announced that uh, so russia will be landing a you know they're in lunar orbit around the moon uh they'll be landing a robotic a spacecraft on the south pole of the moon i guess in the next few days china is trying to land uh, i guess in the next year or so um humans on the moon uh and the united states is, is i think is in 2024 2025 
planning to do the same thing all on the South Pole uh, of the moon. And one of the it was fascinating listening to the head of uh, NASA the other day he, talking about to his concern that if China uh, lands on the South Pole of the moon, they will claim it as their own. Uh, and we're, he's claiming that if, if uh, the United States lands first, it'll be open to everyone. So I guess there'll be some, you know, discussions about that. But wh wh where do you see this going, sir? Well, it, it's hard for me to understand because I take by your question, where is it going? I mean, this is the really the exploration of space. You know, we, we've got to look beyond the moon, beyond Mars. Uh, you know, how feasible is it? Uh, it? There are places we couldn't reach in in a, in a let alone a single lifetime, but, you know, I, you know, are we going to all get some sort of shot and be put into some comatose uh, situation for 200 years in order to get to the next star, uh, you know, in the universe? What do we find there? I mean, there isn't anything. I mean, this idea that maybe there's life or intelligent life somewhere out there, who knows? Um, you know, I, and, you know, uh, can we colonize it? I mean, in some sort of way, can you colonize it? And, can we build something there that is sustainable? Will the exploration of life just be through machines? I mean, through AI and the, you know, that we can't as humans with our vulnerability of, you know, soft tissue, uh, lifespan limit, very limited when we talk in terms of space travel time periods, you know, so, you know, this debate over the moon and, and looking to, to buy a crater front property uh, at high values or something, uh, to what end? I mean, uh, it, it's like an open-ended exploration. Uh, no one knows where it can go. It certainly has the limitations like what I talked about. Uh, you know, and so uh, to me, it, 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 if we get into these petty kind of squabbles that sort of look like the era of exploration, you know, in, in, in the... 15, 1600s and, uh, you know, where we, we all fought for a chunk of land somewhere in the new world or wherever we went off to, uh, doesn't make sense. I mean, it doesn't make sense. Are we doing this for mankind? Are we doing it for countries? And what does it matter if you plant a flag and two acres, you know, to the left or right, somebody else plants a flag. So you own a couple of moon rocks, you know, when, but to what end, you know? So, you know, when we get into all, you know, I'm all for demilitarizing space, and that's hard because we already have a reliance on space. We have a space service and a space command and, you know, in the military and uh, you know, weaponizing space has always been a threat. And, you know, we don't know if we can control all that. Uh, will <clears throat> their presence on the moon present a military threat in some way? Is it just going to be a, uh, you know, we're going to have to form a homeowners association and sort it out on the moon, you know? So to me, all this right now is uh, is petty speculation unless we figure out the longer range viability of space exploration and how to handle it. <laughs> Great answers. Um, the agendas, as far as you know, that the United States has NASA versus the Chinese same agenda, different agendas. Any ideas, sir? Well, I, I want to go back to you know, w w what are we trying to do? I'm, I'm. First of all, I, I think we have a real moral dilemma, and and I'm not. I don't know where I come down on this, but when you tell me you spend billions of dollars to send something in the space to take wonderful, beautiful pictures of exploding stars, when on this planet we have people starving people that are oppressed, you know, people that are victimized, people that, are, you know, can't uh, exist in the environments they're in. I got to wonder, are we going to have the right priorities? I mean, space will be there. Uh, why are we investing so much at a time when there's so much need and better things we could do for mankind? I mean, that, that's my sort of moral dilemma with all this, right, at this point in time. When you fix Earth and you fix people's lot, you know, so those at the bottom end uh, uh, of the spectrum can uh, lead a 
decent and happy and full, healthy life. And we've done all the things we can on the planet uh, to prevent disease and prevent poverty and ensuring we can have an existence here, perfect, protect the environment, all those things. You know, and maybe it's a good idea to stop worrying about space. But we, you know, we're dashing off to space and I look around and I just see so many problems where maybe the resource we're expending resources we're expending could be better used. I don't know. Oh, no, that's a very powerful answer. Uh, and, and neither do I, but obviously space, the moon has been uh, something that's been very prevalent on people's minds, you know, in certain areas. And uh, leave, leave it, it to Dean Martin, you know, when the moon <laughs> hits your eye like a big pizza pie and just use it to, for romance and Stop worrying yeah, about you put your blueprints on there. Well, it's interesting though, isn't it, about the about the Russians in that you know they haven't been in space in almost sixty years. So I mean, it's right, and obviously they're embroiled in a war. Uh, so I mean, I don't I don't know who, who what what anyone's thinking, but it certainly is fascinating that uh, to me that Russia would be going along this particular path at this particular time. I wonder if we left left it up to the average Joe in every country to say, should we be putting this money into the space exploration or into the myriad other things that we have issues and problems with, you know, yeah. from pandemics to poverty, to you know, depletion of uh, earth's resources uh, on and on and on. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because it's in terms of the moon, from what I understand, you know, the main topic is, you know, is there, is there water on the moon? And if you could uncover the water, then sorry, then the moon could be habitable and you could do a variety of things in terms of going to Mars. So it does seem rather... Are you interested in moving to the moon? <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> no. We'll leave it to Bezos and, uh, and, and Musk. <laughs> so I got uh, just on, on that note, because you, you mentioned Musk. Um a fascinating article in the New York Times about all of the satellites that are orbiting the Earth and how many he particular owns. Do you see that as a uh, as a major issue, sir? Uh, I I think there has to be some sort of you know the, the whole aspect of space and what orbits the Earth and you know how we project it. It requires cooperation and management in some way. Uh, you know, I don't know how much of the space junk we could put up there, what threats it may present, how much it may affect uh, Earth, how how it might affect space travel. Uh, you know, it, 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 it comes to the point where there, there probably needs to be some sort of international control mechanism we could all sign up to in some ways. Um, I mean, there is, you know, we've attempted, going back to the atomic bomb, we, we attempted to have some sort of... Uh, international agreement on nuclear weapons now not everybody adheres to it and you know there are rogue nations we worry about uh rogue societies but you know but these sorts of things i think do need some especially now since space uh travel and exploration and support for space stations all been commercialized in some way there probably needs to be some sort of uh, acceptable international regulatory agency just like we do with aircraft that fly i mean we have international norms and regulations on 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 flight routes on procedures and you know safety issues and all so i do think it, you know we have to extend that to space in some way if we can okay well no thank thank you general zinni um again it's always a great pleasure getting a chance to talk to you uh, part of you Amer have. America's place in the world. Yeah, and, and if and if you if you do want to see Oppenheimer and you want some company, let me know. Okay. Yeah, I'm still trying to figure out how to get away. You know, maybe it maybe it'll be streamed on uh, Netflix yeah. or something. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Now, now that I've discovered streaming, you know, with the you know with the Peacock and all these, uh, I'm 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 kind of an old movie buff. You know, anyway, I'm really catching up on. You know, the, the movies that I missed somewhere along the line. All right. Some I'm discovering that I didn't even know were out there are pretty good. Some are pretty <laughs> lousy too, but you know. Well that, a, that's trial and error. Yeah, that's that's right. That's having all these networks. Now I agree. I I I enjoy 
you know, big screen TV, you know, having just uh, eating my Especially popcorn. Especially football games. I love it. It's like yeah. you're right there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, at some point we'll have to talk about the uh, the commanders and the new ownership and so on. And, and I'm only interested in Philadelphia Eagles. So. Yeah, that's true. That's right. I mean, commanders is just cadenate fodder for the Eagles. So. <laughs> well, well, the Eagles had a great year last year, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, maybe better one this year, although it's going to be a tough schedule. Uh, I I just hope the commanders don't uh, don't can Rivera. I think he's had a tough go, uh, and he's a good coach, and he just was put in a bad situation, you know, for a lot of reasons. Yeah, what's well, it's uh, I think we've talked about this briefly, but you know, I guess at some point we should have a discussion about you know leadership organization when it comes to sports and when it comes to the military and it's just it's just fascinating to me that some teams just perpetually are just bad um from from the top down and i'm i'm scratching my head figuring out why why that is and you know you talk about organizations and their competency and uh what they're able to achieve and it's just you know uh and obviously like you know i'm i'm a big new york met fan and you know, they yeah. spent three hundred million dollars this year, and that didn't that didn't do anything. So it's it's not about just the money, right? Um, well, that's true in business too, in the yeah. corporate world. Having having been involved in that for the last uh, two decades, uh, uh, you know, sometimes it just looks like a, a company that has everything going for it and all the right things uh, doesn't it doesn't work out. And you know, why doesn't it work out? Well, the leadership wasn't right. Uh, they didn't read the environment right. They had bad luck. I mean, what? You know, who knows? Uh, there's a, it's a, it's tough to succeed and then continuously succeed. You know, to build a dynasty. You know, you you, you don't see that too often. Uh, and and even the dynasties don't last that long. I mean, Yankees are in last place now. You know? uh, yeah, which I'm very happy about. <laughs> <laughs> I I kind of you know I, I, of course I, I, Philadelphia sports and my sports you know the teams there, but I, I always liked the Yankees. I never had a even though the Yankees used, I used to be a Philadelphia A's fan. That tells you how old I am. You know I go back to Connie Mack and the A's before, uh, and uh, the, they would just buy the best players that the A's brought up. You know, and so you, there was every reason to dislike the Yankees, but I, I just sort of. I thought the Yankees were great. I mean, I used to go to ball games with my father, and you know, he would come home from work and say, "Let's go to a game," and and we go down to Shy Park and sit in the bleachers, and I mean, just saw some greats, guys like Willie Mays, you know, that you just would sit in the outfield and just marvel at what he could do. I mean, yeah. every aspect of the game, he could field, he could hit, he could run the bases, he could catch the ball. You know, he, I mean, uh, he could hit for power, could hit for average. You just see people with exceptional talent up close. You know, you couldn't beat that. And you could go to the ballpark. And, and uh, and of course, as a kid, I loved all the food and everything else. And, uh, you know, and you could all do it all. And every, now you don't have, now you have to sign your life away. And you, know, you have to get a loan to go see a ball game. But, you know, That's in, in the old days, the bleacher bumps, that was uh, the blue collar place to be. Yeah. yeah, well, no, you're right. It's uh, I used to go to the ball games. My dad used to take me uh, when I was younger to the Mets. Uh, when the Mets were horrible in the in the, in the late '60s, but uh, that's right now. You know, I took my sons a couple of years ago, and yeah, it's uh, I think we spent like three hundred dollars. You, yeah. you know, it's it's it's. What did Casey Stengel say when he made a manager of the Mets? Can anybody here play baseball? You know? <laughs> And then Tom Seaver and the the the, the miraculous Mets of '69 changed. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that was. Uh, well, that was a heck of a year for New York. The Mets, the Jets, you know, and the Knicks were right around the corner. So, yeah, yeah. best time in uh, probably New York, you know, overall. But uh, again, thank you, sir. Sure. Give, give my best to Mrs. Zinni. And I will. I, I will talk to you soon, sir. Thank you. Okay. Take care, Adam. <laughs>